Volume spacers. Really simple little plastic things that you put in your suspension and it does something. So I thought we'd explore exactly what they do, when you should use them, when you shouldn't, and maybe delve into some of the science of it as well um, and get have a bit of a deep dive into, into volume spacers because it can make quite a big difference to the way your bike rides. So let's have a look at the different types, what they do, and get into it. Go on, science man. <laughs> and go. Wrong. <laughs> go on, tell me a joke. Come on. Not in front of the camera. Stop right. eating cheese. Actually, I'm going to start eating cheese. I'm making this up as a go along. <laughs> let's dive into what they do. Lots of different types, all specific to brands, all specific to the type of shock or fork that it is. We've got RockShox ones, we've got lots of Fox ones here that clip together. But really, they're a really easy thing to fit. On forks, you just pop the top cap off and pop your, pop your volume spacers in. In shocks, a little bit more involved. You have to take the air can off. There's a little bit more, more work involved there, but it's essentially the same idea. So what are they doing? Well, they are reducing the amount of available volume that your air spring has in the positive air chamber. In your air spring, there's a positive air chamber that supports your body weight and the bike, the sprung mass. And that sits, that pressure sits against the top of the piston between the piston and the top cap of the fork. Um, that's the bit that you squash like a balloon, basically. And those air, air volume tokens or volume spacers just allow us to tune the volume of that uh, air spring, the available volume of that air spring. Um, the negative air chambers normally set by the manufacturer, that volume isn't really adjustable. Maybe on something like an Olin's fork, you can actually take a token out of the negative air, which changes the ride height of the fork, the initial ride height of the fork, how supple it is off the top, so, so on and so forth. But I don't want to go too much into the weeds with negative air volume spacers because this will be quite a long video. So let's have a look at RockShox. We'll concentrate on RockShox, quite a simple system. This is a RockShox air spring assembly. This is a seal head or a, or a bearing. There's a seal inside there. And as your fork compresses, this bit's attached to the lowers and that bit goes up and down and compresses air. So I'll draw the stanchion of the bike, if you like, uh, stanchion of the fork. So we've got the stanchion there, and we've got the top cap here. And these two seals seal that section off completely. So that air pressure or that air volume can now be compressed by compressing that bit like that. So you can see the travel that we've got out of that air spring as well. This one is 170 mil travel. So the amount of volume it uses here is preset by the length of this shaft here. If we use a shorter one, which you can see is shorter, it uses less of that volume. So the same stanchion can be used for different air spring travels. So in a fork with less travel, we need to use more volume spacers to get the same feeling of ramp in the system. Now, what do I mean by ramp? Ramp is essentially the feeling that you get when the compression ratio of the air spring is progressive. So what does that mean? It's quite a complex thing to unpack. Basically what that means is coil springs are linear. So the amount of pressure taken to compress this spring one inch is 450 pounds. To compress it two inches would be two times 450 and so on and so forth all the way through the spring until it's bottomed out. So for every inch, the amount of pressure taken to compress it a further inch stays the same, linear. An air spring is naturally progressive. So if you start off with 100 PSI in a sealed air spring, when you half the volume, you would double the pressure. If you then half the volume again, that would be double the pressure. So if you started with 100 PSI, halfway through is 200 PSI, 
Halfway through that distance is 400 psi. Halfway through that distance is 800 psi. So the amount of force goes up and up and up as you go through the travel. That's about where my science tops out. There's all sorts to talk about with Boyle's law and P equals BBC or something. But here's Steve with some science. So this is the ideal gas equation. The ideal in this case actually means that's wrong. This would suggest that if we were to draw what's actually happening in a suspension fork, this would be the pressure. This would be the travel used. So imagine this is the, the inverse of volume almost. It doesn't quite start at zero, doesn't finish at 100%, but um, it starts at zero travel. So this graph would suggest it's linear. So that would graph would suggest as you go through your travel, it's perfectly linear, like a spring, like a coil spring. And it isn't. For, for a variety of reasons, which we might touch about in a future video, that's wrong. The, this curve tends to go a little bit steeper at the, t at the top, and then there's a belly to the curve here, and then it goes up again at the end of it. So that's kind of a, a generalized spring curve. And as you reduce the volume of that fork, or shock, you tend to get a very similar curve through the mid-stroke and then around about here, it will start going up and up and up. And depending on how much you add, that curve will get further and further apart. And this is essentially what you're doing. So let's say, for, for example, here is 100%. Some of those volume tokens, you might add too many and you might never get to 100% because this, this exponential part of the curve going up there straight from my other formula. Imagine trying to achieve a pressure you would just never achieve because it just goes so far up the graph. Is it clear enough? Yeah. Need different colors? Uh, we need different color pens, don't we? Did you know that used to be green? What's that? It used to be green. Green. In Italy, it's a, it's a witch. Is it? Yeah. And if you're awake, she steals you. <laughs> <laughs> best, best bloody sleep. Stand. So all of that science aside, what does it actually feel like? What does it do to the bike? So I've got a bike in front of me, Norco Sight, with an air shock on the back and air forks on the front. What volume spacers will do for your ride feel is the more that you run, the more the fork and shock will ramp. So the harder and harder it is to get them to push through their travel as you go through the entire travel of the fork. Um, when you don't have volume spacers in, the bike is more linear. So the wheels move easier, essentially, regardless of pressure. So if you have the same pressure in the front uh, fork with volume spacers, it'll be harder to bottom out. Um, from about midway through the travel onwards is where it has the most effect on that, on that curve. In the fork, what they do is they help to stabilize the head angle of the fork. So steep terrain, uh, heavy braking, anything like that, where the front end's diving or you're applying a lot of pressure to the fork, it will just hold the front end of the bike up and just maintain that head angle. What can happen on bikes where you haven't got enough volume spacers is you go into some heavy braking on a steep section of trail, for instance, and the fork uses too much of its travel, the head angle gets steeper and steeper and steeper, and the bike becomes twitchy. Uh, it tends to sort of uh, snatch the front wheel, for instance, and you can go over the bars. That's quite a common thing for not having enough volume spacers. That said, if you've got too many, and you're not using the full available travel um, in a rocky sort of really bumpy track, for instance, maybe that's too many volume spacers. There's no point in having 170 mil travel on a fork and you only use 120 mil of it. Um, maybe that's a case of backing the volume spacers out of the fork. And that's where externally adjustable systems for volume are quite handy, like the Olin's pneumatic adjustable system that we've seen in other videos. With the rear shock, what tends to happen is if you don't run enough, the rear tends to push through its travel and the opposite happens. So the back end of the bike um, dives down and the head angle gets extra slack. So then the opposite happens to us tucking the front, we wash the front. So we get understeer 
And again, this is something you'll see, people losing the front wheel in, in fast, sort of loose corners. That can be lots of different factors, but maybe it could be not enough volume spaces in the rear shock. And the rear shock is stealing all of that chassis stability um, and accentuating angles a bit too much. The other thing that it does is if you don't run enough, you'll bottom out. So you'll, you'll actually reach the end of the travel, there'll be a big bang on the shock and you'll bottom the shock out. The same is true as a, as a fork though, you can run too many and you don't use all the available travel. So it's a balance between the two. And in our setups, that's again why we ask you where you're riding because that will give us a good idea of how many volume spaces to fit, how many to recommend. Um, it's by no means a fit and forget adjustment. There will be tracks where you need more. There'll be tracks where you need less. And that's why learning things like this, watching these kind of videos gives you the tools to understand what it's actually doing in the system. Um, so I would implore you to go out, fit volume spaces to your fork and shock for the same pressure. Don't change the pressure, keep the pressure the same but change the volume spaces, go riding, see how it feels. But let's do a little experiment just so we can see actually what effect volume spaces make in a very scientific test. I need to put them on at the same time. You ready? Ready. And go. Hey, RST, you can help me lift the weights. Got another glamorous assistant. It should be exactly the same. <laughs> Why what's, isn't wrong, it? what's wrong with the equipment? Why isn't it? Should we try again? Steve! Yeah. I'll stop do. eating cheese! Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna start eating cheese. So we've changed the experiment. We're now at 50 psi. We're gonna pull the suspension through its travel to hundred psi on the pump, set the O-ring, and see how much of the volume we've used to double the pressure. Yeah, yes. you see where we're getting? Yeah. <laughs> right, let's go. Go on then, you're bigger than me. Oh, back up. Down a bit. Yeah, you can see there. Ninety-nine, ninety-five, hundred. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Look at that. <coughs> Don't you think that's fascinating? Isn't that interesting? We've gone through 80% so, of the travel, but that's half of the volume used. So even at bottom out, there'd be a fair chunk of a fair chunk of volume left in the in the air spring. Which is why you can fill it with volume spaces, which is I'm sure what Master meant to do now. Let's measure it. 120 mil. How, how much travel has it got? 160? 160. 160. So, so you've used 120 of 160 mil, which is what, a quick maths, 80%-ish? Yeah. Is it? No, I don't know. I'm in front of camera and panicking now. <laughs> a lot of percent. Yeah. Well, let's try with volume spaces in and see what the difference is. Yeah. Next up is seven volume spacers, 50 PSI. Let's go. There. Okay. Yeah, look Much at that. less. So, we've now used 85 mil. About half? Yeah. 30% less? Yeah. Quick maths. So what have we learned? Volume tokens makes you use less travel for the same force. Yes, which we knew already, but it's good to confirm it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, scientifically proven, volume spacers make your suspension harder at a point in the travel. As you can see from our twos and fro's with Steve's Science Corner, it's not quite as simple as you think. There are other factors, the speed at which you compress the suspension, the heat that's produced over longer descents, all affects the pressure, the ramp, um, and it can get really, really complicated, which is why Fox, Olin's, RockShox have got amazing engineers 
making your suspension the best it can be. But I thought that would just be an interesting video to sort of explore what these little tiny bits of plastic do to your suspension and what a massive difference it can make. See you for another one soon.